Welcome to At The Core, the intersection between neuroscience and fitness, where I have the joy and pleasure to speak with many fascinating and high performance movers and ask them questions about how they connect their body and their brain to their movement. Today's special guest is Dr. Willard Wiggin, MBE. Dr. Wiggin is a man famous for creating the world's tiniest and most beautifully crafted micro sculptures that are invisible to the naked eye. His sculptures are typically placed in the eye of a needle or on the head of a pin. A single sculpture can be as small as 0 0.005 millimeters or two one thousandths of an inch. As a child with dyslexia and Asperger's, both undiagnosed until adulthood, he was ridiculed by teachers and classmates alike that he was nothing. He wanted to show the world that nothing did not exist, challenging himself to make smaller and smaller pieces requiring full control over his autonomic system, fine motor system, and much, much more. Willard has since aimed to make even smaller artworks visible only with a microscope. Since he holds the Guinness Book of World Records, he has been featured on Netflix, BBC and more, and has received accolades and a title from Queen Elizabeth II. Welcome Willard, and thank you so much for being here today. It's an honor and a pleasure, Misha, to be uh, joining you on your show. So, so much of neuroscience is understanding and believing things that we cannot see and sometimes at this time in our lives cannot really explain. And your work reminds me of that in the sense of neuroscience. So much of what you do, we can't explain <laughs> and we can't see it and yet it does exist. How have you seen people's impression, expression change when understanding and seeing your work for the first time? Well, I can say this, Misha, through the years of me doing this work, people have said one thing to me, and I've had this, you know, this, this, this uh, compliment quite a few times. People have said to me, I'm not interested in art whatsoever, but I love your work because your work is better than art. They'd say, your work isn't art, it's better than art. Uh, or they'd say, nothing really impresses me, too. Not, ma not many things impress me, but your work blows my mind. Now, when I hear that, I realise that a, a, a wasp can sting you, and that the sting's only small, but it really hurts. Mm -hmm. But it's only small, you know. Yeah. And I've learned that if I say something and I say a few words, I can say a lot more with a few words and lots of words. You know, and I've learned that the best comes from where you least expect sometimes. So I, I learned through my mother's encouragement that the smaller my work, the bigger my name would become. Through the humiliation, you know, I found my salvation because I was told that I was going to amount to nothing. I was, I was told that I was the consequence of failure because I couldn't spell. I couldn't read properly. I was this thing that they call unable. You know what I mean? It's like somebody saying disabled you know, unable, less, less what, you know, um, yes, he doesn't exist or there's nothing in that room. You know, if you go up through a room with no furniture, nothing in people say, oh, there's nothing in there. Of course there is. 
there's little creepy crawlies in there there's all types of little bugs and things going on in there there's that we can't see so i wanted to make my voice become the loudest but the smallest i wanted my work to speak for me sometimes the smallest changes can make the biggest impact that's right and i knew you know as i got started to get older the impact that my work was having i, I did a carbon a peter rabbit on the point of a toothpick and then i showed children mm -hmm. and i showed people but you know kids and and the reaction was oh, wow you know see at school the humiliation became you know my way of understanding that my inspiration was going to become underestimation i wanted to you know celebrate that word because mm -hmm. my school teachers when i started school they didn't understand what i had autism wasn't diagnosed in the 60s people didn't understand so you know in, in the uk there was a uh, system of uh, humiliation you know you know it was different let's talk about that, that you know let's talk about that each each person has strengths and sometimes that uniqueness can only a task can only be accomplished by that person based on their unique strengths correct how have you with dyslexia with autism asperger's found your superpowers rather than these being your kryptonite well you see I wouldn't say I found it. Somebody discovered it for me, if you know what I'm saying. Because mm -hmm. if I was doing this, if I was doing this as a child and I kept taking the lid off this water bottle and then you said to me, oh, that's really good, that is. That's, oh, that's fantastic. You're really good at taking the lid off that bottle of water. Oh, look at the way he plays with that cap. You're really good. So now you've just encouraged me. So now I'm, I'll keep doing it because you said I was good. And I'll be doing it for days. And you'd see, you'd be annoyed by the noise. Right. This is, this is, this is the reverse now. When my school teacher said to me that I was the consequence of failure, I said in the UK, back in the 60s, You'd have certain teachers that would sound like a a horror movie. You know, they say, come along with me. I'm going to exhibit you as failure. You are the consequence of failure. You are not what to become. So therefore, I'm going to introduce you to all the other children and you shall be an exhibit of failure. You know, that's it. It's all over for me now. And especially if she looks like the witch in the Wizard of Oz. No, oh, you dear. Know, you're you're going to be traumatized now. You only have to look in her eyes, and it's like, ha, ha, ha. you're doomed. Your world is over. I'm going to introduce to all the children. And then she takes you around the school and shows all the children your book and your writing. You know, she'd hold up a piece of paper with what you've written on it and say, you know like look how disgusting his work is look look how disgusting he is look at his writing you know so and then you hear that right so now i'm now finished now so i stopped speaking because i thought my voice isn't going to be accepted so why should i speak speak so i stopped speaking i just shut down completely because I was humiliated so much I had I lost my speech. I thought, well, I don't need to speak anymore. But it didn't mean I had nothing to say. So I accepted failure for that moment. So I was When did you find that power then? When did you find that power to be as articulate as you are 
to be as connected with your work as you are, what what recommendations do you give to parents listening to this or kids in the same situation as you've been in? Well, it's like this. Never allow anybody to tell you you can't become somebody. Never allow anybody to tell you you, you're, you cannot achieve. You know, you see, it's like this, right? If somebody tells you something, they tell you that. You didn't say that. They said that. You've got to tell yourself what you want to become and don't listen to what somebody else is telling you what you should become. If you should, if they give you good advice, if they give you negative advice, don't listen to it. Because you see, you can have the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder. But I listened to the angel and the angel was my mother, you see. Because mm -hmm. what actually happened when I was told that, after they took me back into the classroom and said, right, well, stand to the back of the class where you belong. Don't face the class. Gaze out of the window. You know what I mean? So you'd be looking out the window. Mm. And it was a nice day. The sun shining. I could see butterflies flying around and little bugs walking around and I could see birds flying. So that wasn't a punishment. That was not a punishment for me. That was a pleasure. You see what I mean? So I was looking out the window. I thought, that's nice. I said, go ahead, do your worst, almost. Oh, but, in, but being a kid, I didn't really use those words. But I was thinking, I don't mind because I'm looking out the window and I'm not looking at you anymore. I'm not looking at nothing apart from nature. And I saw a and little bug walk, walking on the window that's ledge. I saw, I saw and that is what bug. started this, right, Willard? The, yeah, well, the, well, the thing song, is, when you started making what, homes for ants. Sorry, Misha. Sorry. No, but no. What what made this all start is where I couldn't cope with school anymore. My left leg was in school, my right leg was out. My body was in school, but my mind wasn't. I was mm -hmm. never really there. You could see me, but I wasn't really there. But I decided I wanted to run away from school because I couldn't cope with it anymore. Because the humiliation was too much. So I ran away from school. And whilst running away from school i found my solitude i found tranquility i didn't live too far from the school anyway so i didn't have to run that far and i remember hiding climbing over the fence and hiding in my shed because my mother used to work part-time i remember my dog come running to the shed started scratching the shed like that because he knew i was in there and then i opened the door and he came out and he was kissing me. My dog was, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you have a dog, but. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do. And they're always the biggest greeters when you come home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a dog, you have a dog. And it, my, dog, my dog used to try to speak. <laughs> so you know what? And he had this little ball. And I had the ball and he gave me the ball. And I bounced the ball and the ball went over the next door neighbor's yard and he ran to try to jump the fence. He couldn't do it. He's too small. So he tried to dig underneath the fence to get the ball. And whilst he was digging, he disturbed the ant's nest and lots of ants came out of the ground. And it made me cry. I felt really guilty because I kept thinking the ants have got nowhere to live. And being a young child, I believe that ants could speak in their own little word, in their way. I used to think that the queen ant lived in a palace. I used to think that all the little baby ants went to school. And, I, you know, I went into this world of wonder. So I wanted to help the ants because I saw them everywhere. So what I did, I went and got my dad's razor blade. And I broke a piece of the razor blade off and I got little bits of wood and started slicing them and cutting little grooves off them, little splinters and constructing and building lots of little houses for ants. Amazing. And I built a whole village for ants. And I started making the ants furniture, seesaws and swings and carousels. And, and I made a little palace for the queen ant out of a leaf. I got a leaf and twisted the leaf. And I pulled that material out of my school uniform, threads, and I started tying it around and tying little knots, got out little large windows and 
I've built a, you know, a, a little village for ants. Now, when I did that, I felt happy because I think the ants are going to move in. They're going to have somewhere to live. I made them some tables and chairs and, you know, I made a little carousel out of a piece of foil. I bent it over and made it into a comb and pushed the splinter down onto a piece that? of hardboard. And, How you know, could I made... you see all of this, Willard? You How know, could you I... see all these things and move with such such fine motor skills at that age and see everything to this age, 60 years later, your vision. Well, you see what actually happened, you know, it was a gift that I had when I didn't know I had it because uh, the autism allowed me to do it because without autism, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So autism became my friend at that time. So I, when I finished these little houses, I remember kids came home from school and one of the next door neighbors kids skipped down the garden path in the uk they used to skip a lot they <laughs> always say nursery rhymes a lot ring a ring a roses the pocket full of toes tissue <laughs> tissue you all fall down <laughs> here comes the chopper to chop off your head <laughs> all types of silly things three blind mice see how they run Cut up tail with a carving knife. You know what I mean? It's like a horrible. Yes. You know what I mean? You know, like hickory dickory dock, the mouse. Yeah. Up. You know, things like that. And, um, there was one where they used to sing, like, um, it was uh, Goosey Goosey Gander, where shall I wander upstairs and downstairs in my lady's chamber? Then I met an old man who wouldn't say his prayers, so I took him by the left leg and threw him down the stairs. The they were also went, off, weren't they? We didn't know what we were singing. <laughs> the stairs went crack. He broke his little back, and all the little dogs went quack, quack, quack. What the hell's that about? Violence. Very violent. You see what I mean? So, you know, you, the kids would do that type of thing. And I remember she was skipping down the garden path, singing some, about, I think it was gingerbread bread man or something. Run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me on a gingerbread man or something like that, you know. And, she, you know, they do all those types of things back in the 60s. And then she stopped and looked over the garden fence and seen me and told me that my mum's looking for me and my mum's not happy and all that stuff. Then all of a sudden she went, oh, wow. Like that. And I thought, what, what's, what's your problem? Because I didn't think what I did was special. And then she says, that's the bestest. That's the bestest. And you know when she said that to me, right? It's like a, a shower coming down of encouragement. So all the drip, driplets of water are rubbed into my body. So it was encouragement. It was like I was washing myself with what she said. I heard the word the bestest. And then I heard her say, Mom, mom, come and have a look at this. Mom, look. And the mom came down the garden, but the mom told me that my mom was looking for me. And then I heard her say, I heard her say, she went, Oh my God, that's fantastic. And then more shower of encouragement came down, you know. So I'm now in a shower with people. Telling me what encouragement I, can do for somebody, what yeah, so words saying, can do for somebody, saying, you know, they just told me I'm good, they just told me that I'm good, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, and I, I was like, sort of, it's like a, a, an injection of encouragement being pumped into your body, like a battery being charged up, and I'm like, oh. Thank you. So, but I never said the word thank you. I was just like, oh, it said I was good. <laughs> and then my mother came home. And then I could hear them talking next door, calling me, the lady over the road. She says, come and have a look at this. The lady was across the road, Mrs. Price. No, Mrs. Meese, her name was. She came around. She said, have a look at that. And Miss Meese went, oh, wow. And it was like more encouragement so now i'm now believing that i'm the best thing since sliced bread 
<laughs> she's gonna be and then um my mother came home my, my mother wasn't very happy because she knew that i wasn't at school she found out but my neighbor rescued me by telling me that i was she collected me so then they told my mom to have a look what i'd made and my mom seen what i'd made and my mom was went like this <gasps> like that with disbelief and you know when she said that when she'd done that i didn't know why she did it for then she said that's amazing and she said she told me to bring it in the house and she put it on the table then when she did it she looked at it and then she said something to me she said it's too big if you make them smaller your name will get bigger so when i heard that misha that was the journey that's when the journey began that's when i started to go on this journey to become the, the greatest micro artist that ever lived I, I never want i never wanted to it's like i felt like there's nothing else i can do this is it I, this is what i want to do after you get humiliated by the teacher i thought well i can't do anything else that's it this is what i'm going to do the things then, that it when I, I did a, my mom told me it's not small enough so I, I i got a little piece of splinter of wood and i carved peter rabbit on it uh-huh and i showed my mom and she said it's too big so every time i make something it was too big <laughs> so i be now i'm now possessed i'm now possessed because i have no other way of because i can't read well i can't write well so what do i do so this is what i'm going to do the so things I, it takes to do this though willard the, the, it's not just about the art it's not just about going small to a microscopic level the skills you need to be able to do this take training take immense amount of care and precision you have complete control over your autonomic system over your breathing your mm -hmm. heart rate you, your fine motor skills how, how have you trained this how have you maintained this how did you train this well if, if i if i explain something to you if you've got a small piece of paper and you like say uh like this and you rip it up because when it's big when it's big you can just go like that mm -hmm. but when it gets smaller you start being more careful and everything slows down and, you, and it becomes harder because it's smaller to rip it so what happened this is the extreme version of that is i knew then i had to be very very uh, careful within my movements so over a period of time my dexterity was trained i trained my dexterity i trained my body to slow down because that's the only way you can't rush it and go you can't you can oh, i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do it it doesn't work like that you got it, I started just training my body. You know, if you see a tiny, tiny little, beautiful little butterfly, you're not going to grab him like that, are you? You're going to go, oh, come here, little butterfly. Come here. Come here, little butterfly. And you're going to be very, very careful. Very gentle. He's going to hurt his wings. Come here, little butterfly. Fly away. And he may say thank you in a little butterfly language. He may say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's I mean? amazing. So it's been so, over you know, time. So Smaller over time, time. Over time, I evolved. Because. And and I imagine this is the same for the mental resilience. But but how? What tips would you have to help others 
build and increase their mental resilience because the level of focus you need is and the precision you need and as you said you mentioned i read in an article saying you don't enjoy this work per se that it no. is incredibly difficult and uh, laborious and unforgiving and unsupportive <laughs> it's not a pleasure to do it it's like trying to get a get a pin and put it through a bubble without bursting the bubble you see it's irritating but what it does it it trains your attention span you know you, you start thinking well if i you see, I remember what I was trying to say, right, Mish, because my mum told me that I had to honour what my mum says, you see. I had to tell myself that if it doesn't work, it will work next time. So and I'll keep going because it's like, it's like this. It's that lid again, yeah. But you've told me that, you know, the opposite to that, which is something positive. So now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to stop because you've just told me that I'm good. So I have to honor your words. I have to please you with my skills because autism is is an extremity of behavior patterns so i so what i do i become possessed so i become tenacity i become mm -hmm. like my life depends upon it i start to think things like Oh, I have to do it. If I don't do it, somebody will, will die. If I don't do it, I've got to do it. I have to do it. And and this this sort of immense belief system kicks in, and then and because you can't do anything else, your body's going to compensate. So you start developing other skills with your hands and your, you know, because, you know, it becomes your voice. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can academically, you're not going to express yourself. You're not going to write and read well. So what choice do I have other than to become the greatest micro artist of all time? What do I? My, what, my dad my dad had told me something that resonated with me and he said do what you're passionate about because if you follow your passions you'll be able and willing to work hard and if you're willing to work hard you have the chance at being the best yeah, and if you're the like best I can, I everything can say, follows that's right Misha. i mean i can say to you you're going to be the greatest at what you do you're going to be interviewing the most significant people in the world one day. You're going to be, you're the future of this. You're the fu future of this. You are going to be great. You're going to find more of yourself. Like I found me, I lost me. And then I found a jigsaw puzzle that I put together. But in the middle of the jigsaw puzzle, there was something missing, and that was me. And I put me in the middle, the missing piece, and I became complete. Because the piece that was put in the middle was my mother put it there. She put it there. She put it down for me to find it. I found it. I put it in. So I completed me. So I, I found me. And then I realized then that everybody loves what I do, so I'm going to please the whole world. So Amazing. throughout my whole life, I went through my senior school. My, you know, I wasn't really there. I was never in school. The only thing I used to like was the food. I liked the school dinner. I liked the desserts. <laughs> and I, I liked the, that's it. I just like, 
you know, the kids were okay. I got on with them. You know, I used to have some good friends and, you know, but I was never really, never really there because I couldn't spell. I couldn't read well. And whatever they try to teach, it was about all their history. It was about Henry VIII and William the Conqueror and things like that. I didn't want to know about that. I wasn't interested in that. World War One, World War Two, and you know the, the history of certain things. I don't even know what it was because I didn't learn it. I didn't want to learn it because they discouraged me from that. So therefore. Right. I am just a leaf in a cul-de-sac. I've been just blowing around, you know. I, I didn't. I didn't want to show that anybody anything. I didn't show the teachers what I was capable of. I didn't do that. I just didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a part of the whole thing. The so, encouragement is the key. Your mother was a huge encourager of you, being positive, but also knowing how to push you, when to push you knowing what you're capable of, you have gotten to such a microscopic well, level. Well, it's like this, Lisa. I can say, you see, I wanted to show the world how big nothing is with my artwork. My mum used to say to me, say lots of words and mean nothing and say a few words and mean everything which you can you know yes. you know the best things come in small packages you know just because someone's not saying anything that don't mean i haven't got anything to say you can't hear mm -hmm. it you know so i knew that just because you can't hear what there's that sound said anything what happens when they do say something listen to what they're going to say so that's why I, I, I was inspired by uh, by the underestimation. I wanted to sort of honour my mother's words and say, right, mom, you, this is this is what I'm capable of doing now. So now I'm going to go on this journey to become what I've become today. I left school, age 15. I worked in the factory. No qualifications. I couldn't even read the time. I couldn't even spell my own name. That's but, so you know, I think I think these are, are shackles that the society has of what is successful and what is intelligent. You say, well, there's nothing else you could do because you couldn't read and write. But all I hear and I imagine all my audience sees is someone incredibly talented beyond just art, bringing in other aspects that allow them to be successful with that. For example, can you talk a bit about how you make your tools. There are no tools on the market that are small enough to paint the things you're painting. Well, the tools have to be especially made, you see, Nish, because the tools are just, just as important as the sculptures. You know, I, I get acupuncture needles and cut the point off them and sharpen them down and make little hooks out of them. I, I get a, a very fine pearl drill and I'd get a jeweler's dremel, and it's like a tiny little disc, diamond disc, with fine diamond powder on it. And you press a little button, and the little motor turns, and it goes, zzz, and it polishes, you know, the blade down into a very sharp little blade. Or I use a, a hypodermic syringe, break little bits of diamond off, and push it into the end of the hypodermic. Mm -hmm. So there's crushed little sharp shards of diamond. And I use those to cut cut with. Amazing. You know, to chisel away at things with, you know. And I just keep experimenting. I use my eyelash as a paintbrush. Your I'm eyelashes? A, one eyelash as a paintbrush. Unbelievable. I, I make um, little tweezers out of my eyelashes to lift sculptures with. So I do things on a really molecular level that will enable me to to create the work that and I finding not being stopped because the tools don't exist but instead creating the tools you need to continue on your journey yeah it's like you know you have to be like a 
if I can put this in in, in, in into perspective, you have to be a little god in your own world. I'm not saying that you know I'm I am God. I'm not saying that. I'm saying mm -hmm. you have to be a little god in your own world. I am a little god in my world because I have to create a little miracle for people to see. You see what I mean? Wonderful. And, yes, absolutely. And once I've made these tools, I know those tools are going to enable me to create the work that I'm going to inflict on the world. Because I know that what I do is going to make me become it's going to make me become successful. It's going to make me become um, well known. That's just the same as being successful, I suppose. It's going to make people appreciate and understand. I'm going to create mysticism and wonder into people's mm -hmm. mind. I'm going to challenge their belief system. I think this is a big one. Yes, absolutely. And, you know. And in these chats, we often discuss the importance of the inner dialogue. And you mentioned being a little God in your own world to create these miracles. But oftentimes we can, the conversation we have within can either self-sabotage or can enhance one's accomplishments. Same as you've experienced from external sources of, of ridicule to encouragement. What are your words? What what is the message you speak to yourself? I'll tell you what the message is. The message is this. I have to, I have to find a way to tell the world. If you can hear this noise, I shall put it away. Sorry about that someone my phone's on silent and it started buzzing so no problem that's gone there right i have to tell the world that i have a message to deliver i have a key that smaller than a pinhead and that key is going to open the biggest door in the world and when it opens the door, behind that door is me meeting the Queen, my doctorate, my MBE, my documentary award. So that key has opened the door to my success. It's opened the door to autism. It's opened the door to see that the little things in life make the big things happen it, it's open the door to show the world about how people underestimate you know it's open the door to educate people about understanding people with learning differences and giving people a chance to show what they're capable of providing people take the time to listen and to understand so my work is a message to the world. It's, it's, a, it's an education. So I am, I am a messenger with, with a, a tiny, tiny, tiny little key. You see? That is really beautiful, Willard. I, I appreciate the analogy. And I think this will speak to so many people struggling, trying to find themselves, trying to find their path, trying to find their, their purpose. You see, everybody is born with a certain gift, but it's it's unwrapping it and finding it. And unfortunately, some people never open the trash bin to find the diamond, you see. It's in there, mm -hmm. but it's up to someone to open the lid and show them what, what's been thrown in there. Yeah, absolutely. Because I have that's, a little... that's what happens, you see. Yes. See, I have a little... Speed round for you, Willard. These questions are going to be the first thing that comes to mind. It's going to seem random, and 
you're just going to answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Working morning, afternoon, or night? Well, I have now moved to an area where there's no traffic. So I can work. I used to work at night because it was quieter for me. But now where I live now, I live in a little cul-de-sac. There's no cars go by here. So now I can work even longer now. So I prefer <laughs> night still. I prefer night because it's more quiet. I don't hear nothing at night. In the daytime, I can work too. So now, you know, I, I can work. I suppose I, I, I would choose the night time, I suppose. But, night time? But I, can work. I, I, can, I would choose the night time. Sweet but, or salt? Sweet. Go on. Sweet. Planks or squats? No, I didn't say salt. Say that question oh, again. Sweet, sweet or salty? Oh, I prefer honey anyway, because that's sweet. <laughs> and it's natural. <laughs> Salt's no, I don't do salt because it's not good for you. I have a little bit of salt, of course, but not too much. Not too much. Planks mm. or squats? Say that again. Would you prefer like ab work or leg work? I think leg work, you know, because you have to walk. <laughs> shoes, shoes or barefoot? Well, shoes, that's because you're going to get splinters in your feet. So you can't, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, yeah, shoes. Beach, beach or mountains beach because you can fall off a mountain <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I prefer the music, beach anyway. music or silence silence Heat, but i like music but not when you're working no i prefer silence though i like silence Heat or cold? That's easy. Heat. Heat. <laughs> inside or outside? Inside in the summer, in the winter. Inside in the winter, outside mm -hmm. in the summer all day long. Inside looking out, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jasmine or peppermint? Peppermint. Spontaneous or planned? No, that depends because sometimes spontaneous is better than when you plan things. Because I met my fiance spontaneously, you see. I saw some of the best said, things can happen spontaneously. Yeah, because I just said to her, I said, I'm up for adoption. <laughs> That's all I said. And she said, Okay, <laughs> I'll adopt you. And that okay, was last years one. Ago. This one's a hard We're still one. together now. We're still together now. That was eight years ago. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, spontaneous does work, you know. Planning is good sometimes. They're both as good as one another if it's done properly. Wonderful. I like that answer. Spontaneous is better. Learn something new or perfect something known. Depends. It's good to learn something new, providing it's good. Perfecting something known can be good as well, because you're perfecting. So they're, as good as, they're both as good as one another, really, when you think about it. They're as good as each one, other. One. Yes, I they would agree. They complement each other, don't they? It's like a seesaw. It's like a balance. They almost. do complement each other. And we, we have this question with each of my guests every single month and every single time. It's always hard to pick one because we always understand the value of both of them. Yeah. This was amazing, Willard. I I am so honored to chat with you. I know we could go on for hours. I of love course. your stories. I 
is there anything you would like to share with the audience? There's so much we could touch on, but anything you would like to share with the audience, a message you want the audience to know well, is important. Well, the, the only thing I can say is that sometimes always listen to people, see what they have to say, listen to them. If someone's talking to you and if they have a speech impediment and they're, they're, they're stuttered, listen to them, listen to what they've got to say. Don't pass them by. Wonderful. I would completely agree. Thank you so much for your time on your busy day and coming in this evening to speak with me. I feel so honored, so blessed. You truly are a diamond in the dustbin, as your mom would say. And for all of you listening today, look inside of yourself and realize the smallest things can be the biggest things happening for you. Learn to accept who you are and see the value and your gifts and how to apply and challenge yourself to bring about the possibilities that are there for you. That is perfectly pitched the way you said that. And also, you know what they need to understand in life, everything starts small. We all came from that little cell. We made up of atoms. That's what we made of. And then we grew. You know, you get a small tree, a small uh, seed can grow a mighty oak tree. You know, these mighty redwood trees. That was all one small. Everything was one small. You know, and, and so we grew, you know, and you can have a small business that can do big business, even though it's a small business. So absolutely, don't underestimate, you know, an ant small in stature, but immense in strength. You know, it's not the size of the the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog, you know. So, you know, don't ever look down upon anybody. Always give people a chance, you know. Don't eat too much. Eat healthy. Eat lots of vegetables. Drink lots of water. (laughs) Drink lots of water. Drink Drink lots lots of water. Drink lots of water. And appreciate the little things in life. Appreciate, you know, people were complaining, oh, we can't go abroad, we can't do this, we can't do that. I mean, your country is so beautiful, you don't need to travel, it's already there, you know, I'd love to come home with it sometime. You can sit in your yard. You have a just... home waiting for you. Yeah, I'm coming. You, you, you can sit in your backyard and just look out the window and feel good, you know. As that's long as you beautiful. have love in your life, that's that's all you need. That's so, so wonderful. You know, you that can, you, is the best way. things are all around us, but we just have to find them sometimes. We appreciate that. Is them. So I appreciate cool. shutting my eyes and sleeping. I appreciate that. I Gratitude appreciate not saying anything. Sense. I appreciate not saying a word. I appreciate thinking. Mm-hmm. It's through thought, you know, the best inventions come from. When you're in bed quiet and you're sleeping, shut your eyes. That's when great things occur. Some of the greatest writers of all time do that because it happens while you're resting. So, so wonderful. So to all of you at Out The Core, thank you so much. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. I hope you realize that you have what it takes to be great and that all of our uniquenesses are a superpower. And we'll see you again on At The Core. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you got something out of it. We'll have many more videos that help you with rehabbing your shoulder, low back, knees and everything else that will allow you to be active and healthy through all the things that you love in life. Please feel free to follow us on all our various social media channels and we hope to see you back soon.